please have the opportunity to introduce you to our speaker today, Teresa Hansen. Um, Teresa was an undergraduate. Teresa is originally from Denmark. She was an undergraduate at the University of Copenhagen and then went to get her PhD in Heidelberg working with Norbert Versleeves Group. Um, and now she's a postdoc at Carnegie Observatory for International Science. And she's going to tell us about her work today that she's been doing with herself, but then we've been lucky to collaborate with her on the project that Dan and I have been working on in Dark Energy Survey following our <laughs> peculiar uh, Metal Four Stars. Uh, and I will also say that she's going to be here all week. She's part of our Mitchell Institute Visiting Astronomer program. So you have a, I hope you all get to talk to her today. But you'll Mindset for the rest of my talk. So, if we look at this nice, very table, we have the Big Bang, which gives us hydrogen and helium, pretty much nothing else. And then come the first stars, where we have the hypothetical burning, and we get carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we get the alpha elements, and we go all the way up to the iron group elements. Um, and then all the rest of it comes from fusion capture processes. Um, two kinds of future capture process. We have the slow future capture process and the rapid future capture process. The slow where you have uh, future capture and then there's a time for uh, the to decay. So you follow this stable path of building up elements. And then you have the rapid future capture where you have a lot of future captures. And then at some point the, the nucleus get very unstable and they actually do decay. Um, so you move <coughs> on a path very far from stability and then the process ends and sort of go back to, to where the stable uh, nuclei are. And they sort of roughly produce half and half of the okay, heavy element. This doesn't come up very well, but the purple here is the upper process element dominated and the uh, red are the S process dominated elements. Um, we have a pretty good idea about where the S process happens. Um, we have the main S process happening in the asymptotic gap red stars. So the neutral source is Kappa 13. And then we have the weak gas process happening in massive stars with the neutral source is uh, two. So we're talking about the main and the weak gas process. It refers to the neutral source. Um, for the rapid neutral capture process, the picture is very much less or very much unclear. Um, we also talked about the main and the weak here, but here we, it refers to um, the area of the elements, so the light forms are produced in what we call a weak R process, and the head works are produced in what we call a main R process, and the candidates at best candidates at the moment are the neutral star mergers and dead supernovae. So dead supernovae are basically supernovae from fast rotating stars that has uh, strong magnetic fields with results in these jets coming out of the R process uh, production of these fields, or these jets. Um, for, the very, for the light R process elements, uh, we can also have some Normal components. So there's a whole lot of things that may come to the, to the upper process. So that's sort of where the elements we see in the universe come from. Um, but I'm talking about metal four stars. And why am I talking about metal four stars? Why are these interesting in terms of, of new physics and the universe? Well, the metal four stars, as you can see in this figure, we have a big bang. And uh, yeah. uh, sometimes you're here, and we have the first stars, which were pure massive, this short thing, glowing supernovae. And then they enrich the external medium in elements, and then we uh, form the first open stars, which are the metal core stars that we look at today. So the metal core stars are the first um, low mass stars formed in the universe, and since we can't actually observe these first massive stars, then we can look at the Bonuses of the metal four stars, 
I get my idea about what happened in this first generation of stars. And that's why the are four stars in the moon the interesting. And just to show you what an other four star looked like, um, you have up here, this, up here is the spectrum of the sun, which isn't visible for of course, doesn't grow rich. Um, you know, bright presentation, we have the well, it's just zero for the stars, we have lots of light, lots of living. We go down to you know, this the velocity of minus four ish. Then it's this one up there. Um, but you see there's still a few lines. We have some iron lines, we have some nickel lines. But if you go even further down, minus 5.3, we have a few iron lines left, but pretty much nothing. And then in principle, if we had this with no nulls, we would just have a good season of the lines. Um, so in principle, these small four stars are kind of, kind of nice to work with because they have nice, clean, single lines. Okay, so the title of my talk was kind of really peculiar about four stars. And that is because um, when people have looked at large samples of uh, four stars, they found that a large fraction of them are actually enhanced in color, strongly enhanced in color. And there's no really good reason why this should be. We don't really know where this color comes from in the very early universe. As I said, the, you have the first stars that you normal hydrostatic burning when they explode in supernovae. There's no reason why they should produce a whole lot of carbon, but we do see a whole lot of carbon in the universe with these four stars. And now just bracket the nice spectrum that the four stars have, but when carbon comes into the picture, it goes a bit bad. Um, what you see here is uh, three, the three stars with similar cell parameters. The top one here doesn't have a carbon enhancement. The second one has a little bit of carbon. The last one here has a lot of carbon. So you see all these lovely nice CH which basically messes up the spectrum a whole lot and makes it a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to do abundances with these stars. Um, we have different types of CFP stars, carbon packs, little four stars, um, depending on the neutron capture uh, abundances. We have the CFP no stars, which I'm going to focus on today. Um, and these doesn't show an enhancement neutron capture elements. We still, they still have neutron capture elements, they just run past them. And then we have the CMPS stars, which have the S process elements, CMPR stars, which have the R process elements, and the CMPRS stars, which show a mixture of R S process elements. Um, I'm happy to talk about all three of these, um, but I won't go to some of them today. Okay, the other type of chemically pure star I'm going to talk about today is R process enhanced stars. Um, there's not that many of these, but we do find some stars that show a large hand in, in R process elements. And you see this, uh, the full spectrum you see here is one of those. You see we have lots of europium, and other neutron capture elements that we normally don't see in these non four stars. Um, and just as a, as a case thing, we sort of separate them into the R1 stars, which are highly enhanced in R process elements, and the R2 stars, which are um, highly enhanced in R process elements. So those are the two types of chemical peculiarities that I'm going to talk about. The carbon stars and the opposite stars. Okay, so before we go into the abundances, abundance results that we have for these stars, we want to know how they got to be chemically peculiar. Because we have two, there are basically two options for this. One is that they could be in binary systems that have mass transferred from an evolved companion, which the deposited processed material along to the star that we see today. Um, or it could be um, a sign of nuclear synthesis happening in the early universe. So we need to figure out which is which if we're going to say something about the abundances that we see in these stars. And to do that, we took a large sample of opposites and hands that found on, about 60, and we looked at them for about eight years. We had one night to run for about eight years. This lovely telescope, the Canary Islands. Um, and we monitored the radial velocity of all these 60 stars and to find the binary frequency of these. And the result that we have from this is that for the CMPS and CMPRS, so the, the carbon stars, which also show uh, a signature of S process elements and a combination of R and S process signature or R and S process elements, they're basically all binaries. Um, the, S, the CMPS stars has these very nice circularized uh, orbit of, with a period of about a year. Um, and the C 
CFDR and stars have quite different orbits. Um, they're very eccentric, they're very long periods. Um, so it's, it's clearly not the same type of, of uh, binary component that they have, but nevertheless, they are pretty much all binaries, and the, the nuclear synthesis that we see on the surface of these low mass stars is not um, a population three signature, it's the signature of death. It's still metal core and still interesting, um, but it's not population three. Um, for the CFP no stars and the opposite of that stars, which I focus on today, um, we found that they're all single. So yay, this is actually um, nuclear synthesis happening in the early universe. Uh, what you have at the left here is a rather famous um, CFP no stars, BD44, um, which has been monitored for a very, very long time. Did this very last bit, um, but it's clearly very stable. And these two over here are two famous opposites and head stars, which also show no variation to the regular ones. Just so, yeah, when we look at the, the uh, abundance patterns of these stars, what we see is actually a nuclear synthesis of the first generation of stars that form the universe, which is what we, we want. Okay, so let's move on to the actual. Or, yes, the abundance part. So, as I said at the beginning, um, the, we have a large fraction of Kalman and stars um, at the moment of this team. And these are the numbers to show you exactly how large fraction. And it increases when you go to lower moment of this team. So, about 20% of the minus 2 star, about 40% of the minus 3 star, and 80% of the star we know with the list team, less than minus 4. Uh, are common past. And also, another feature is that when you go to lower normal density, all of them are basically of this year, you know, variety. So the ones that don't, that show it has been common, but not in neutral capital elements. Um, this you can also see on this sample of stars from Norris and um, where the black ones are the common normal stars, the blue ones are the CMPS Rs and R stars, and the red ones are the CMP no stars. And this is all very null boring, but as you get to the most null boring, or the RCPS stars. This guy here is the only um, ultra metal core star known which has not shown has been covered. Uh, and it, it was found in 2000, I don't know, some years ago, um, and it hasn't been found anyone since. We only really have an upper limit for the capital balance in this one. Um, it's a, it's a dwarf star, but some people argue that we basically just don't have good enough data to get the cover from this star. But that's a whole different story. But the main point is, long velocity, all of them are seen in the stars. Um, and so we took a sample, or we, we basically, um, during my PhD, and uh, we, we basically decided to take all the metal core stars that were known at the time and do a homogeneous abundance analysis of them. Because the, the different approaches in determining stellar parameters and abundances can actually lead to quite um, substantial abundance differences in the stars. So it's, it's important to do, to do these analysis in a homogeneous <coughs> manner. Um, and we had a sample of about 200 stars. 70 of these were calipensed and um, is to confirm what I just said, it goes to lower and lower velocity, more and more of them, a larger and larger fraction of them are kind of enhanced. And since this is a very well core sample, then we also have quite a large number of CMP nodes on the of them. So this is the sample that I'm going to talk about for the next, uh, the next, next slides. Um, so, One thing we wanted to look at was the amount of mixing and processing, CF processing in the early universe. So when you have um, hydrogen burning via the CNO cycle, you will all know that we effectively um, create or we effectively produce hydrogen at the expense of carbon uh, as there's a bottleneck in this uh, process. And then when you have mixing in the star, you'll press these abundances up to the surface and you can actually see this abundance signature at the surface of the stars. Um, we know this to happen in the evolved low mass stars, the 
go up the diaphragm so you see this the signature. Um, but since we were interested in the progenitors of these stars and not the stars, the processes in the stars themselves, um, we looked at um, only dwarf stars, so one of the stars that have not evolved to do this processing themselves. Um, and so we looked at the carbon nitrogen abundances in this subset of, of our um, carbon gas stars and to see if we could separate them into a group that showed low processing, so more carbon than nitrogen, and a group that showed high levels of processing, so more nitrogen than carbon. And this is what we got. Um, so over here we have uh, all of our dwarf or subgiants in the sample. And we have the normal mode postage, but the CMPO with the red, CPS, CMP R, and CMP R. And so these are the not so processed stars, or where the, uh, certainly not so processed uh, Whereas the ones over here show uh, more nitrogen in their atmospheres than carbon, that indicated that there's been a lot of uh, processing and mixing uh, in the generators. And if we look at um, the plot the abundances, the carbon nitrogen abundances of these stars over here, or the plot all of them, but the triangles show the, um, the stars over here, the dots show the stars over here. Um, and you're going to see, in the next couple of times, you're going to see plots like this with all these different colors. Focus on the red ones, these are the CMP no stars, the others are not the types of carbon stars, as I said, but just focus on the red ones. Um, and if you try to find the red triangles over here, you will see, so the, the carbon CMP no stars that show large amounts of processing and mixing in their progenitors, you will see that they're all at very low velocity. Like basically, um, all below 3 minus 3.5. So this indicates that in the very early universe, um, these progenitors have a large degree of processing and mixing, um, which we can now see in these low velocity stars. If we move on to the light elements, um, so sodium, magnesium, and uh, aluminum, we also see that, again, below this velocity, um, we find some CMP no stars, again the red symbols, um, with large enhancements in uh, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum. Above this velocity, we don't, there's less, uh, less scatter. So we have um, large degree of mixing, but we have um, large overabundances of, of light elements uh, at this very low velocity, so very early on. Um, if we move on to look at the alpha and iron peak elements, we see moderate uh, enhancement in alpha elements and generally a fairly low star to star scale between the, for the, for both the alpha elements and the iron peak elements. And this is sort of a, a general abundance uh, signature that's seen in most null core stars, which is the um, signature of, of cochlea supernovae. Um, so in this for these two or for these two groups of elements, the CMP no stars doesn't really separate from the rest of the, the L4 stars. This is basically the same. Um, if we go on to the newly captured elements, we again have some difficulty or some differences. Uh, where we've got the absolute abundances of barium and strontium, as a of metallicity, we see that the um, the black points here are the uh, carbon normal stars, um, but we see that for the strontium, you have to basically have a decline in strontium bonds with the as you would expect. But for the barium, if you look at this one over here, which is the carbon stars, we sort of see a floor in the barium abundances. Um, it's definitely happening between minus three and minus four. <coughs> What's happening at lower velocity is a little bit difficult because it's supposed to be other limits. We have that rare range. Um, but clearly, there is some um, really capture uh, production at these very early times. Um, remember, the CMP no stars were the most known for us, so the first uh, low mass stars to form after these, uh, the first generation of massive stars. Um, yeah. So, 
those? So clearly, whatever produced the carbon also produced some amount of barium. Um, the question is, what? Because we have um, two suggested progenitors for carbon in the universe. We have the spin stars, which are these massive, metal-free, fast-rotating stars that, because of their rotation, have a lot of mixing. Um, and a lot of uh, processing, and this can create large amount of carbon, which are then rich to the surface and expelled to the internal media uh, in, in winds. Um, and, and this is a table of what these spin stars can do. This is not a big table, but what you need to see is this column over here, where basically you can create this CMP no stars with all the other signatures that I just told you about from these um, spin stars. So you can create the the CO2 no stars with the um, with both uh, CN ratios above zero, below zero. You can get some um, magnesium. You can get uh, sodium. You can get some S process elements. Um, the only thing that these stars don't explain is the uh, normal alpha and IP element abundances. You need a supernova to create those. Um, and that's the other candidate for the talent in the universe. These are the fake supernovae, which are um, supernovae which has a lot of mixing in the outer layers, and then they have a mascot below which everything falls back to the uh, top level. So basically, only expels the, the outer layers. So you can create these large amount of light elements and not so much of the heavy. And if they fit the profiles of these the yields of these um, supernovae to the uh, or CMP no stars, they do pretty well. What you see here is all the color points are um, measured abundance in CMP no stars, and the black lines are their supernova yields. And they do a pretty good job all the way up to sink, and they stop. So these don't have the mutant capture elements. Um, so just to summarize, um, we see these signatures of uh, large amounts of mixing happening in the burial times both the spin stars and phase two to do that. Um, we have the enhancement light elements, sodium, magnesium, aluminum. Both the spin stars and to do that. The alpha and peak elements, which are like normal alpha stars, well, that's the phase two that's coming here. And then the fusion capture uh, production of the structure of the barium, well, that's basically only the spin stars that explain this so, so far. So if we want to discriminate even further between these models, um, the next thing we can do is that we can look into the, the elements that form in the deeper layer of the supernova, like silicon, see what, what actually comes out of this. Or we could look at more um, neutral capture element abundances um, in these stars and see if what we see is actually uh, a weak S process as it would be if you see some in the spin stars and see the massive stars. Or if it may be more of a normal process or something else. Um, so that's sort of where we are uh, with the team of stars. And that's. So I'm going to move on to the R process test stars now. <coughs> and just to remind you, we had this R process elements, um, about half of the helium elements above iron. And we believe we have two main sites. Um, or there are two, two uh, main candidates, say, for, for the production side of these, um, which are the new star mergers and the jet supernovae, um, which seem to be both able to produce this main app process, and then we have a little bit more, more, more little, a few more contenders for the, the weak app process for, that produces the, the light elements. Um, and this has actually been a problem in astronomy for about 60 years. We haven't actually been able to to constrain the astrophysical side of the R process for, for that long. Um, <coughs> so one of the really good places to look are these R process enhanced L4 stars. And the first one to be discovered those was this guy, CS22892052, more commonly known as the steam star. Um, and this guy was discovered down in the 90s. 
And what they figured out already from the first spectrum of the star was that the um, abundance pattern for the heavy elements in the star matched that of the scale solar system composite abundance pattern. So what you see here in the southern right is the composite abundance pattern, solar system pattern, dot in order of the gas process. Um, about 10 years later, when they got more abundances for, these, for the star, to a more full abundance pattern, uh, they again saw this, um, this very nice match to the solar system process of understanding, roughly from um, barium to barium to hafnium in this middle region. In the light end, or for, for the light elements, the match really wasn't that good, and also a very heavy end, the match really wasn't that good either. But this was one star, um, and people figured out that these stars were probably pretty good to look for. So uh, Lachman uh, carried out a search where he took that spectrum about uh, 250 uh, Melbourne stars from the Hubble Gizu survey. And in that sample, he found eight or two stars. So eight of the really strongly enhanced opposite stars. And uh, about 35 of the Albert stars. Um, so these are two stars that really were. This corresponds to a fraction of about 10% of all Melbourne stars that are far opposite. So they're really rare and hard to find. Um, which is also why today we only know about 25 of the storm we passed. We know quite a few more of the Alvar stars, um, but it's really, really these we need to uh, to get the full amount of time to learn about the Alvar's production sites. So what have we learned from those um, stars that we already have? Well, it turns out that this lovely match to the solar system Alvar's abundance pattern that uh, they found for the theme star. Well, that turns out to be uh, true for, for all the other stars as well, basically. So what you have here are six R2 stars, and we see in this middle region, we have a very good match to the solar system, Amosha's uh, abundance panel, which is the, the sort of line. For the light elements, the scatter is somewhat higher, and again, for the heavy elements, also a lot of scatter. And when this, this was looked at later for the R1 stars, they again found this very nice match in the middle region, larger scatter in the, for the light ones, and larger scatter for the, for the hit ones. So whatever produces the opposite elements that we see in the R2 stars seems to be the same process that makes the opposite elements that we see in the R1 stars, and it seems to very, be a very robust event that creates this, um, deals with the same uh, abundance pattern each time, basically. Um, and as I said, we have this, uh, scatter in the heavy elements, which has given rise to a whole new group of stars, the actinite boost stars. Um, and that is that we have a number of our two stars, we have more than one star, which show uh, an enhancement in the actinites, so thorium and uranium, with respect to the second and third peak opposite elements. So basically, if you look at the uranium, you broken to thorium um, ratios of these actinite boost stars you see that they have a lot more thorium than uranium compared to, to this normal uh, R2 star. Um, but we don't really know how many of the opposite and stars show this, and it's mainly because getting uranium is very difficult. It's this little, little bump in here that we need to detect. Um, thorium is a little bit more easy, um, but it's, it's still a really hard measurement, and we need really high resolution, really high signal noise picture, and we will and we need the stars that are highly enhanced in our process elements to, to see this line. Um, and of course, people have also looked at the uh, lighter elements in these stars, so the alpha and iron peak elements, to see if we can, to see if these distinguish themselves somehow from the normal metal core stars, if this could help us in determining the production type of the alpha process elements. Um, but no. Um, we have the same same results we had for the for the counter enhanced stars that for the um, alpha and iron peak elements these stars look like the normal metal core stars. The C over here is uh, calcium and titanium for a sample of R1 stars compared to uh, normal metal core stars for some of the, the black crosses. There's really no way to distinguish uh, one sample from the other from the color. Um, and over here, Ian Broder took a large set, or to basically all the R2 stars known, and compare them to uh, 
compare the uh, light element abundances to, to normal metaphor stars, and as you can see, the, the difference of abundances between the two samples is almost zero. So you can't you can't pick the the abundances and then start out from their um, alpha and high peak abundances. Okay, so for a long time, these um, abundances and stars were only known to exist in the halo. We haven't really defined them anywhere else. But then, what's this about a year and a half ago? But Sigma 2 came along, um, which you probably all heard about, because this was kind of quite uh, kind of an event. Um, but Sigma 2 is this ultra faint dwarf galaxy where seven out of the nine stars that uh, Alex G analyzed turned out to have a large condensed non process elements. And you can see them here, they're the red uh, dots. So if you have the um, barium and europium abundances of the great, all the greatest halo stars. And the other color points are other, it's fake both galaxies, but then you have the particular two stars up here. And then you have those two that didn't show in the but, but they go up in other limits. And of course, they also took the abundance pattern for the heavy elements of these stars and compared that to the solar system offices above them. And yay, they got a very nice match again. So, with whatever process created the offices elements, you see in the R stars in the halo seems to be the same process that happened in particular two. And with the fact that we have this in an ultra faint dwarf galaxy, it gives us an environment and constraint of the environment where this event has to have happened. Um, so that's very, very cool. And one good thing doesn't come low. So we found another ultra faint dwarf galaxy that also shows an upper system enhancement, um, or at least the, the one star that we know in it so far. And this is um, Tikkun 3 where uh, we found an R1 star, so not, not as strongly enhanced as the stars in particular two, but still enhanced in our system elements. And um, what you see, this is just the synthesis of different options of the lines. And when we took the solar system abundance pattern and matched it to the abundance pattern that we found in the star in Tikkun 3, we find a nice match as well. So again, the same process. And again, we have the not so good match for the light elements. Um, when we found this star, or when I looked at this star, I thought, well, maybe there are actually more of them in dwarf galaxies that we just haven't noticed because they've been one in the sample. So I took a look at the literature um, of stellar abundances in dwarf galaxies, and there are actually quite a few. Um, Maybe in more, uh, more massive dwarfs, so less of Iron has quite a few. Um, Borax also has quite a few. Um, and these more massive uh, galaxies show both our one and our two stars, actually, which is interesting. Um, but since it was an our one star we found in, in Tokena, uh, Tokena 3, we took all the our one stars in the other dwarf galaxies, and we Plot their abundance patterns against the solar system abundance, offers as abundance pattern, and that's what you see over here. Um, so you have the, the minor stars down here. You can see Draco, Forex, and Carina, and then the Tokyo 3. And again, we find this very good match. Um, so, really, uh, the offers that creates these elements that we see in uh, one of our two stars, both in the halo and the dwarf galaxies, all seem to come from the same. Uh, in it, or to come from the same collection site. Um, and of course, we also compared the um, uh, alpha and iron peak abundances in our, our one stars in dwarf galaxies uh, with the uh, with the halo of our one stars, and that's what you see in these plots. So the gray dots are the halo of one stars, and the color ones are the ones over here. And really, there's there's no distinction. So uh, again, it seems that they're only peculiar because of their uh, alpha system enhancement. Not so much else. Um, so you might ask, well, if we have two galaxies, uh, two similar galaxies, like particular two and particular three, also fake both galaxies, <coughs> then why do we have a very large enhancement in one of them and only a mild enhancement in the other? Uh, I mean, if, if a neutral time merger went up, in either of these galaxies, surely you would see the same level of enhancement in the, in the opposite stars. Um, and 
we thought about this, and also why you see the the, the different levels of the other North galaxies. And um, the reason that we came up with this is that it's simply a dilution thing. Um, so basically, if you take the European hypothesis and the uh, iron galaxies of these stars and plot them, then you will they will form sequences in this plot depending on the amount of gas in the galaxy available to the light that would be ejected. So you have the uh, the two, two stars on the three points out here, the light three points out here. So there we didn't have a lot of a lot of gas. Um, whereas in the more massive dwarfs, like um, Ursa Minor, where you have the red point here, we have more gas. Um, Carina, we also have more gas. So basically just to dilute it, the the output is ejected even more. Then again, why is Tuck 3 sit there with all the other R1 stars? Um, well, Tuck 3 could have been more massive in the past. Uh, another option is that the uh, nucleus incident didn't actually happen in the galaxy, but happened somewhere next to the galaxy. So it was only polluted from the outside, and only some of it made it into the galaxy. But in principle, um, you should be able to fill up this entire um, uh, diagram with different sequences of um, of the past arc, depending on the the uh, um, provinces of the of the North Galaxy, and then it should, as you can see, the the uh, one stars or the the halo of one stars are the great points here, and so you should basically be able to to, to fill up up the whole uh, range that they fill up. <coughs> okay, so. As I said, we have two promising sites for the process. We have the new star mergers, <coughs> and we have the jet supernovae. And how do they do in explaining all these abundant signatures that I've just talked about? Well, pretty good, actually. Both of them. Um, what you see here is uh, the black point in both of the plots is this um, uh, fast forward uh, R2 star, the Stephen star. And over here we have different um, different divergences with different provinces, and in this middle region uh, where we have a very good fit in all the upper system stars, it doesn't really matter what model they put out; they still they get the same um, abundance, rate, uh, abundance pattern. Um, in the light end, it scatters their bubble scales scatter a little bit more, and in the heavy end, you also see some scatter. Um, and the same goes for the uh, jet supernovae, where they have uh, a neutron uh, neutron cap uh, neutron production in the, in the what they call the prop jets, which produce this um, this middle part, this very robust pattern each time, and then they have some contribution from the late jets, which can produce the light elements. So really, if you want to distinguish between these two models and you want to explore these two models, we need to get the abundances here and here. I mean, the one that we have in the middle, um, and which is actually most of the abundance that we have with these stars, because this is where we have barrier and Europa, which is most easily measured, um, but they don't help us because both bonds produce the same uh, same output, and even if they vary the model, they still produce the same output in this in this range. Um, so we need the light and we need the heavy. And for the sample of our two stars that we have now. We can't get that. They're too faint, they're too, it's too difficult. So, we started a new survey for our system head stars. Um, and as I said, they're very rare, so we plan to obtain a spectrum of about 2,000 stars to find about 75 new R2 stars. <coughs> and obviously, this is going to take an extreme amount of time. Um, so, we only take the very bright stars, so we can actually go through all these stars at a reasonable amount of time. Um, we also only choose the cool stars where we know we can get the Europa uh, measurement, or at least a, a, a decisive upper limit. And then, of course, we want the normal ones. Uh, so the, the stars that we look at to show um, their abundance patterns are the result of only one or two resistances to this. Where are these stars again? Uh, most of these are from the radio survey. OK, so they're in the disk or the? Uh, yeah, disc or the the disc or okay. um, we also have some from. We basically just 
look through the whole history of the and whatever we could that, uh, that satisfies these. But, but the main source is the rapes, I think. Okay. Uh, well, so we get the preliminary of the uh, parameters for the low resolution spectra. And there we choose the giants. But the low resolution spectra are not always, I mean, the parameters that we get from the black ones are not always true. So some of them are always, but most of them are giants. The ones we've looked at so far, at least. Um, and we had a pilot one for this project uh, in the Department of Telescope in August last year. We got 110 stars. And we believe that we've already found uh, seven actual stars. Or at least um, what you see here is spectra of seven stars from our survey compared to this classical R2 uh, star, 16 star. You see the European one, and there's a final line next to it. And you see all of these stars have very prominent broken lines. Of course, we need to do the full parameter, parameter distribution and the bonus analysis to make sure that these are actually R2 uh, stars, but they're definitely opposite the next. This is very good, and of course, we um, have four observation ones, which means I get to go to Chile all the time, which is excellent. Um, and when we then get these, pick out these uh, uh, opposite stars from the DuPont spectrum, we'll go to uh, Mike at the Magellan Space Telescope, and we'll get higher resolution, higher signal flow spectrum, from which we can get these light opposite elements. We can get the whole uh, abundance range of these. And hopefully, we'll also be able to get more stars from get thorium, uranium, find out what exactly is the fraction of these actual stars, what's their region, how, where they come from, how do we do them. Um, and since these are bright, we can get all the spectrum if we get time. We actually just submitted a proposal for two, uh, two stars that we found um, to get all the spectrum of those. And then of course also just getting uh, a large number of opposites and end stars will allow us to better determine the fraction of these with halo and to determine how many of the, how many galaxies like um, particular two, those of minor, all these dwarf galaxies that we had opposite stem stars in, how many of those do we need to create to build up the population that we see in the halo. Um, so this is hopefully a very exciting project that will run for, for some years and will turn out a lot of exciting results. Um, and to my summary, um, so I told you started my talk with talking about the Kevin has no four stars. Uh, we have a large fraction of these in the halo, especially at low velocity and at the lowest velocity we start to see for those stars. And in these we see a lot of the size of mixing, uh, which has happened in the real universe. We saw some large impacts in light ovens at low velocity. And then there was this um, hit of the barrier floor. So whatever progenitors uh, we have for uh, producing this large amount of color. They also need to um, to fill up these other uh, abundance carbons. And then we have the opposite of hand stars, but we see this very robust pattern in the, the abundances uh, from barium to Hopkins for basically all uh, our, two, our opposite of hand stars we know, independent of the level of opposite of hand and independent of whether they're in the halo or in the dwarf. So we have this uh, very robust uh, event that produces the same output every time. Um, but then we see this gather of the light at the heavy opposite elements, and um, we started this new survey to, to find more opposite and stars and see if we can, can constrain them all better and figure out what to do with this, with this gather. Thank you. So uh, you had a table of like number of number of more process and half stars versus dwarf galaxy, yes. I think, right? Um, the answer to this question is probably not informative, but is there is, is it possible to plot like you know that versus like the stellar mass or something like this? Is there any correlation? Uh, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't look like that, but I mean, it is something you thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, but you, you you could do that. I think we. We actually did do that, but the thing is that um, obviously we need 
both Europe and America the vaccines when we start to know if there are other suspects. I see. So, so we, as a, we, these these numbers are they're probably more. I mean, they're, they're probably more what? There are probably more of the other suspects stars in these galaxies that we just don't know about. Yeah. So the question is whether it will be. But these these numbers are the first of minor you found seven R one four R two stars out of seventeen stars. That yeah, so those are the so those are the seventeen stars in those minor that has high resolution spectroscopy. Right. So, and that's, I mean, so right. So you looked at seventeen stars in Harris Minor. Yeah. Uh, seven of them, or yeah. you know, roughly half. Forty percent. Yeah. Roughly half. Minor seems to be quite our Right. And that's sort of a trend. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in Fornax, but we yeah. tell Fornax actually, seven. a lot of the stars in Fornax actually showed a uh, higher barrier of brand new open as part of the NS process. The return of this. Right. So that's very different than a few percent of the in our data. Yes. Um, in, in all of those, basically. But the few percent that we found in our halo are from the uh, the Bartlett search. And I can promise you already now that this search is going to turn up more. We found quite a, a larger fraction already. Okay. But all right, so I guess my question, maybe this is what we would really ask you, certainly what I would ask is, you know, if the halo is made up of stars that usually be in dwarf galaxies, how can the fraction of these sorts of stars be so different? If, yeah, well then maybe not all of them come from dwarf galaxies. I mean, you also have... Right. I think there's also a very heavy selection function here. Right, so that's, the, that's the other kind of question. So I may have missed Are you pre-selecting them in any particular way when you find the highest in the system? No. The, from the survey? Yeah. Uh, so the, these, are, these are all, all already some features. So the only selection. We, we want them bright, we want them relatively cool, and we want them open. Okay. And we also try not to get too much color. Um, but that's not really heavy. Okay. How are those like, criteria different than the part one? So I think the the Barton survey, those are um, kind of issue side. I think they basically just took the most notable ones that they could get the spectra off. Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure what the selection was. But they're a lot bigger than the ones we do, and they're definitely not all. And they're also not very formal for Okay. Um, yeah, so you're, so you're talking about you're trying to figure out what the for the R process stars you're trying to do all these extra observations to figure out for the light and heavy elements yeah. trying to figure out the formation scenarios. Would you expect like either one or the other like either um, or would it be like a mix of the two? I, I think it's I think it's a mix. Okay. Um, my inclination would be that we have People there, well, they were they were all pro neutral star merger, which sort of colors the picture of it. But they talked about that this jet supernova that it, it doesn't. I mean, you can't really explode it. I mean, the, the models are not really consistent. Um, so, so that side of it clearly needs more work. But I'm pretty sure that if you go to people who work on that, they will say, sure, please success, we can do this. Um, but but this, I mean, neutral star mergers has been. Uh, they were proposed already in the 70s, I think. Um, that's the, the site of the, the Apple process. And, um, and all the modeling that has been done up until now has shown this very robust film. Um, the light of the heavy has come uh, with more recent modeling, uh, but, but they seem to be a very good site. So you don't think that the excitement of working on Star is, is all due to the light of the It will be great if we can observe them. I mean, that would be, that would be a lot of excitement. Um, and another thing is also the amount of ejector that comes out of these is much larger than these. So, so you, you, need, you need more of these to, to create the amount of processing that we see. 
uh, at both levels via the web. So, so again, we have to talk about our In one of those dark matter dominated dwarfs where there's a few thousand stars, how many neutron, suppose they are all R1 or R2 stars or R whatever stars, so for how the, many neutron star mergers do you need to make it up to? So for this one, they need one. Just one. Yeah. Uh, Second two, they may be calculated that they need one neutron star. One neutron star for sure. But then pollutes whatever the ISM is, and all those stars form out of that. Yeah, so they actually argue since they have these two stars that are not Alpha enhanced, uh, and these are at lower velocity than the rest of them, or the, the other stars that they look at, they actually argue that, that um, this this time or this velocity is when the neutron star merger. So you have some time without it, and then you have a new star merger, and then you have else. So there was some star formation happening before, happened, yeah. and it was a, I can't actually read the axis anymore, but I mean, for <laughs> so you have, of something. You have a velocity of like minus 3.5, <laughs> minus 4. Right, and that somehow produced one neutron star, neutron star merger, and then the next generation of star formation reflected the element of abundance is that one and then put out into the ISM. Yeah. So will will one neutron star merger also create a higher FE over AI? Uh, so first of all, the neutron star merger doesn't put out any R. Alright, so, so something it. else then also had to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, so obviously, uh, so you have, I mean, to even have the neutron star merger, you have some supernova, right? Um, which, um, and then there's some sort of delay time until you have the merger, and in that time, you still have normal supernova explosions in the galaxy. So but aren't these, I was free. iron comes from type 1 supernova, right? I was free. like, yes. Uh, yeah. But there's a delay time in that, involved in that too, right? It's either type 1 or type 2. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, for some reason, it just never sticks in my brain. This <laughs> probability is probably type 2. Uh, you get some for both, actually, but yeah. But I think you get most from type 1A in principle. Sorry, we, yeah, we were talking over you. You wouldn't have time for that at, at this low velocity in these galaxies. Yeah, but there's a yeah, so there's a delay time in both of these then, yeah. like in the neutron star mergers and the and supernova one A. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I mean you have to think about it. There's not or it depends on your model of star formation, but that's not very much time between the on H of minus three and a half to three. So oh. it's not pretty quick. Yeah. If it's a sort of any kind of constant rate. That that has also been one of the objections to the neutron star merger is that does it actually happen early enough? Well, you make the, I mean, if you make the evolutionary time scale get here for the neutron star binary, it's, a, it's almost a three parameter. Yeah. Just, it's well, you can make them like arbitrarily close, like what you're saying, or do whatever the hell right. you want with the orbit, right? So it's, it's, it's related to the, yeah. the, the, the masses, how fast they evolve, and how, how the tightness of the binary is initially. So you, know, you, have, you have a whole bunch of knobs you can turn to make pretty much whatever you want. Yeah. So people actually try to use these kinds of results to put constraints on how fast our a little bit of a scratch in my opinion, <laughs> but I, it'd be cool. If like I said, you have, you have so many other knobs. You have the initial angular momentum of the system. If you turn way down, you can, have, you can go really fast. Right. If you turn way up, it, takes, it never happens. Right. So it's... Yeah. It's a chilling Yeah, I, mean, but I think the funny thing is that the, the, well, not funny, but the interesting thing is, is that they all, there's some, all these sort of small dark matter dominated dwarfs kind of show this. I don't understand that if it was Well, they show one, something, but they all show something different and peculiar. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's they, show, they all show something different. peculiar, but what is peculiar is different. Yeah, I mean, but the majority of them have.